is my fault You are the friend That answers my call You are my day You are my night You are my love You are my I'm Steve Carr, pastor of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande, and I'd like to welcome you to our program. Marriages and families are in great turmoil today in our country, I'm sure you would agree. But how is your marriage doing? What's going on behind the door of your home? Is your marriage in trouble? Have you given up thinking that there are no solutions, no answers to the struggles you're having with your spouse? Well, I want to encourage you today, there are answers, and they're found in God's Word. I believe the one who created marriage knows how it works best. And so will you get your Bible, get your spouse, and ask God to open your heart to His truth. All right, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 we're going to start with. Now we started with this particular passage in our first study. And this particular verse, I think, is especially applicable to our study tonight on how to develop sexual intimacy in our relationship. And so notice what, what uh, Moses declares here in verse 24. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. What an interesting and what a beautiful statement this is concerning Adam and Eve there in the garden. They were both naked, and they were not ashamed. An awesome thing. God brings these two people together, and he makes them one. And literally, it says here, he joins his wife He is joined to his wife and that they become one flesh. Or literally, in the Hebrew, it is one body or one person. Now, this particular topic is always an uncomfortable one. Uh, Many times, people that come for counseling, when they uh, begin to address their uh, issues of their struggle in their sexual relationship, it is usually way down the road where they have had great difficulty and they have waited a long time. Most couples are very uncomfortable about discussing this issue because it is such an intimate and private issue. And so really a study like this is really a better format, I think, to discuss the issue because we can talk more in generalities about some of these issues. And so I want to encourage you, there are, there's probably no subject that I haven't counseled with a couple about on this particular issue. If you're struggling in this area and you feel that you need counseling on this, I would encourage you to do so because it, it is an, an important and integral part of your marriage, as you'll see in just a minute. Now, what enables you to develop greater sexual intimacy in your marriage? This is the question that people ask me over and over again. And so I think that it's really an appropriate topic to address. What helps you to develop that intimacy with each other? And I think the obvious thing is what what enables you to build this, if you look at the opposite, you'll see these are the reasons why that intimacy has maybe waned in your relationship. And so let's just look at this subject. The first issue that I think is so important in establishing 
sexual intimacy with one another is that intimacy really has to be developed in all of the other areas of your marriage. And that really is a priority. Now, when I speak about intimacy, most of the time people say, well, yes, that's sexual intimacy. But intimacy is more than sex. And that is an essential understanding. Intimacy really begins where we started this study, and that is dealing with your spiritual relationship. If you want to have an emotional intimacy, you first really need a spiritual intimacy with each other. If you want an intellectual intimacy, I believe it begins in the spiritual area as well. If you want a sexual intimacy with one another, it begins spiritually. And it goes down the road from there. That is the key to your companionship with each other. It begins with where you're at spiritually. Because as I've shared with you before, every single marital problem is first a spiritual problem. And so when I'm selfish, what is that? That is a spiritual problem. When I am harsh and I don't respond to you correctly, what is that? That is a spiritual problem. When I am just looking out for myself, I could care less for where you're at and what's, you're going, what's happening in your life, your needs, what is that? That's a spiritual problem. And so you have to address this. First looking at yourself, where you're at spiritually. And what kind of intimacy do you have there? Can you talk to each other about the spiritual things that God is doing in your life, in your own heart? Can you communicate about those things without getting in an argument? Do you have intimacy as far as just intellectually? Can you talk about things, your ideas, your beliefs, your, the way you see things? Can you have that relationship with each other over these issues? How about recreationally? I think that recreation together is probably one of the most important parts of companionship because that's where you find friendship with each other. And friendship is a key to intimacy. And so many times people say, well, we don't ever do anything together that's fun, so we just, you know, that's just the way we are. And yet they don't make that connection with the lack of friendship the lack of romance, the lack of sexual intimacy with each other. But it's all connected. In 1 Timothy, or excuse me, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it declares that we are body, soul, and spirit. Now, if God wants to sanctify us, body, soul, and spirit, then those three entities are extremely important in your life. And you, they, are, they are intricately connected. You cannot separate them from one another. And so it's essential that you see this, this need for all areas of your marriage. Now, I usually like to give an analogy that I can understand. And ladies, forgive me if, if this is um, a male illustration, but... But the issue is an eight-cylinder engine. Now, I've been a mechanic. I've uh, built engines before. I know how an engine works. And so when you have eight cylinders in an engine, you have eight spark plugs. And you have eight spark plug wires that go to those eight cylinders. Now, if you pull off one of those spark plug wires, one of those cylinders is not going to fire. And what happens? that engine begins to move and it's rough, I'll tell you. It'll still run, but it will not run very smoothly. So, you pull off a second spark plug wire. What's going to happen then? That engine is going to die. It's going to stop. Now, many times, as people are driving their relationship down the road, 
sometimes one of those spark plugs comes off and it becomes very rough. They aren't firing on that particular cylinder. Uh, sometimes two spark plug wires come off and all of a sudden their engine dies. And I'll tell you, they begin to coast to a stop. And that's when they usually come for counseling. They usually come and say, hey, something is wrong. We are not going forward. We are stopping. And if you get out and you fix what the problem is at that particular moment, I guarantee you, you'll get that thing running again and you'll move on down the road. So it is essential. You cannot divorce sex from the rest of your relationship. Neither can you divorce the rest of your relationship from your sexual relationship. So this is essential. You have to hit on all eight cylinders if you want a smooth ride, if you want to get where you want to go. And so this is an essential truth. So if you believe this, what are you doing to build intimacy in these other areas of your relationship? I'm not talking about sex now. I'm talking about what are you doing to build spiritual intimacy? What are you doing to build intellectual, emotional, recreational, uh, your communication? intimacy. How, how are you building in those areas? Because that is the key. If you are doing nothing in those areas, then you can't expect that your sexual relationship is going to hum. It's not. It's not going to be what you want. So you have to address all of those issues. Secondly, Intimacy is developed in an atmosphere of total commitment. Commitment to one another is the, is the only ground I've ever seen real, true intimacy grow in. Commitment is essential because the scripture makes it very clear. In the Song of Solomon, in chapter 6, verse 3, there... The Shulamite said, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Isn't that interesting? I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I mean, we are one with each other. There is a commitment there. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, it says, Let each man have his own wife. Let each woman have her own husband. Notice the emphasis there on own. Your own husband, your own wife. One man, one woman, and you're committed to that person. Now the reason why I bring this up is because in counseling, I have husbands and wives tell me that they have said, had some very terrible things said to them and threats made to them. Threats of leaving because their spouse is not meeting their sexual needs. Well, that completely destroys your intimacy. You just took your relationship back to zero, okay? As soon as you make that threat. I've had people say or tell me that they have said, well, you're not, if you're not going to satisfy my desires, then I know I can find someone who will. Or... You're not the only fish in the sea. Really nice, huh? I'll bet you that would really encourage the intimacy in your relationship if that was said. It won't. And so it is essential that you stop, that you see that you have to be committed, you have to declare your commitment to each other. And in the ground of commitment and the assurance of commitment, that is where intimacy is truly built. If you've ever made such a threat, or if you've even implied it, then you've undermined your own intimacy. And so, go back and get that right tonight. Now thirdly, intimacy is developed by fulfilling your responsibility to express your affection. 
Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, it declares this, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now notice in this particular set of verses, what Paul is doing is he's describing here a mutual responsibility and a mutual authority over one another. It doesn't say here that the man has total authority here, total control. It doesn't say the wife has total authority or control. It's a mutual authority. It also describes a mutual responsibility to render the affection due them. Now, this is, I think, one of the most important biblical passages on the topic of sex. Because what it does is it describes for you here the, the, the reality of why God even created sex. It is, this, here is the reason why God created sex to begin with. It is so you would express affection to your mate in the most intimate way possible that you will not express to any other person on this planet. That person alone. And it will be an intimacy that is expressed by affection. So that's what it's all about. That's what sex is to be. It is where you express and render this affection. It is the primary purpose for sexual intercourse. That is the, what the scripture teaches. Now, the question is, is that what you are rendering to your spouse? Are you rendering real, loving affection? Or are you rendering duty? There's a big difference between the two of those because real affection is something that you cannot fake you cannot put on you cannot hide if it is there someone's going to know it because you care about that in that individual if you're just doing your duty then you are undermining your own intimacy in this area because your spouse is going to pick that up. I have had to address this issue with men that are unresponsive and wives that are unresponsive because the other person obviously can pick this up and they sense it and the intimacy that they have is it remains very shallow or it decreases over time depending on how the couple relates to each other. So it is essential that you, you see that this is your responsibility. This is what you're called to do. And it's simple. You just say, Lord, give me the affection in my heart for my spouse. And if you say, I don't have any affection in my heart for my spouse, what is that? That is primarily, first, a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual issue. And there's a reason why that affection is not there. And you, so you have to find out why it's not there. Fourth, intimacy is developed when you choose to act contrary to your feelings to express your affection to each other. Now, when love is reduced to a feeling alone, love is very shallow. Love is more than just a feeling of infatuation. Love is something that at times is a sacrifice. It's hard. It's a sacrifice because you don't have the feelings. Okay? And so that's why they call it a sacrifice. I think that it's important to understand that, you know, when Jesus loved us and he went to the cross... He was choosing to love us in a very powerful way, but he didn't have all the good feelings when he went to do that. How do I know that? 
Well, in John 12, 27 and 28, Jesus said this, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so he's troubled, clearly, in his heart. Matthew 26, 37 and 38. It says there, he began, first he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he there, was there in the garden, and it says he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said, my soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And of course, this is when the disciples went to sleep. Now, if Jesus loved me and loved you, when he didn't have all the good feelings, I'll tell you, there is the example of what real love is all about. So you, when you say, well, I don't feel like it. Well, he didn't feel like it either, okay? Now, I understand there are times when you're emotionally upset, you're um, sick or something like that. That is truly an exception. And that really brings me to my next point. Intimacy is developed when you choose not to deprive except by consent of the other. Now, this again is a clear teaching from 1 Corinthians 7, 5. He says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he tells them here, I want you to express your affection to each other because you don't have authority over your own body. Your body doesn't belong to you any longer. And because of that, he says, don't deprive one another. Now, you say, well, do couples really do that? Yes, they do. And I, I'm sorry to tell you, I counsel this one all the time. And it is a difficult situation. It will ruin and destroy a marriage where one person will deprive the other person of sexual relations for innumerable reasons. I'll tell you, I've, I've heard them in a lot of them. Now, when you choose to deprive, you are choosing to be selfish. When you choose not to deprive, you are choosing to love. That is what Scripture clearly teaches. When you choose to give of yourself where you are clearly commanded to, then you are choosing to love. And to choose to love is to choose to be affectionate to one another. Not some, I'm going to do my duty. It is, I care about you. I love you. And I want to express that to you. Now, people deprive their mate for many reasons. Sometimes they do it to manipulate the other person. Uh, you haven't done what I want you to do, so I'm not going to, there's no sex for the next month. And because you aren't doing what I want you to do. Other times, people have just a whole myriad of unresolved conflicts with each other. It's real hard to be affectionate and loving with one another when you have a whole host and list of conflicts that are unresolved and you're bickering and fighting and yelling at each other. Um, doesn't sound like a real romantic experience to me. It's, it's not going to happen. Sometimes there are, are past abuse issues. I deal with uh, counseling with people of, with uh, sexual abuse in their past all the time, both men and women. It happens, and it's a reality of life. Probably one quarter of all women have been sexually abused by someone in their past at some time in their life. That's what the statistics tell us. And it's a sad thing. The statistics are much lower for men, but they're there. This is an issue that I think is essential that people address on our website, uh, calvaryag.org. We've got a, 
uh, a document there that you can go and look at. It's called uh, How to Deal with Past Abuse. If that has occurred in your life, you need to take a good look at it, read through it, and address those issues. Don't let it go. Now, when you do not deprive one another, then you are building intimacy with each other. If you do choose to deprive each other, you are destroying the intimacy with each other. It's just that simple. You can't, it's no more complicated than that. It's just a reality. It is a decision that you make. Couples have told me, you know, Steve, when we have regular sex together, that we hardly ever fight. And I say, wow, that's interesting. And, you know, you hear that over and over again. And then people that say, you know, we're not having any sexual relationship or very rarely. And the, this couple is fighting all the time. And usually it is, they're, they're, it, the issues are coupled together. And so it is essential, as I said in my first point, deal with all of the issues, not just the one. Now, why is this issue of defrauding someone so personal and so destructive to your intimacy? Well, it's rejection. That's what it is. It's that simple word, rejection. If a person is giving you lame excuses for why they do not want to be intimate with you, after a while, those excuses get real old. And you say to yourself, that really isn't the reason. The reason is you do not love me. You do not want to be with me. There is some other reason. Now, if that is not the issue, then you have to say, what is the issue? Because it is the will of God, it is the plan of God for a husband and wife to have a sexual relationship with each other. That is the will of God. It's clear from the scriptures. So if that's not happening, you have to say something is wrong and we have to find out what it is. Because the essence of defrauding someone is that person is going to feel very rejected. They're going to feel that you really don't need them, nor do you desire them. I've had men and women tell me this over and over again. I do not feel loved. I do not feel desired. I do not feel wanted in this relationship. And that is spells danger with a capital D to your marriage. Why do I say that? Because that's what Solomon said. In Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. In fact, turn there with me in your Bibles. I want you to read this one with me. Because it is an essential passage to, to really let grip your heart over this issue. Now, you remember Solomon is writing to his son. And he is giving his son counsel in his life, for his life. And in this particular section, he's talking to his son and telling him how he should see the sexual relationship between he and his wife. He says in verse 15, using imagery here, figurative language to describe the sexual relationship in a more poetic way. Notice, he says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them, only, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. So he describes a woman's sexuality here as a well he describes the male sexuality as a spring or a fountain. In verse 19, he says, As a loving deer and as a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? 
Now, first in verse 19, notice that he says here that you should be satisfied with the sexual relationship that you have with your mate at all times. Literally, the Hebrew here, at all times, is at all seasons. Or literally, all seasons of your marriage, from the beginning of your marriage to the end of your marriage. So, God has created us as sexual beings, and he has intended us to have some kind of sexual contact with each other throughout our lifespan, throughout our marriage. And he wants it to be satisfying. That is his intent, clearly taught here. He says, always, not sometimes, but always, be enraptured with her love. The word enraptured is a Hebrew word that means to be intoxicated. It speaks of a romantic intoxication with your spouse. He says, for why should you, my son, be enraptured, same Hebrew word, by an immoral woman and embraced in the arms of a seductress? Now, if you do not show your spouse that you desire them, that they are wanted, that you, are, you have affection for them in this area, then you are putting your marriage in great danger. I'll tell you, I talk to couples that have committed adultery on each other, and I always ask them the question, how did you get here? Sometimes they say, well, Steve, why is that important? And I tell them, well, if you don't know how you got here, if you don't know how you got to the point that you committed adultery, then you will probably do it again. So if you want to fix this, you've got to f- determine how did you get here? What caused you to do this? And when the individual, the husband or the wife, whichever the case may be, tells me the reason, it always boils down to this. It always comes back to this issue. When someone is not desired, is not told that they are loved, that they are cared about, that someone wants them, that they want to be with them, and they just take them for granted, and they abuse them verbally or physically, or they do any number of things to them. What's that person going to think? This person doesn't care about me. They don't love me. They don't want me. They do not desire me. And then the first person at the gym that shows your wife some attention, the first woman that shows your husband some attention at his job and begins to express that they are desired, well, all of a sudden that person has got a major temptation in front of them. And that's how it happens. And so when I deal with couples that where adultery has taken place, I have to say, you know what, there are two sides to this issue. There are two areas of responsibility here, and there is responsibility on both sides, usually. So I encourage you, stop and look at this. It's, it's a serious issue that you cannot just say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Notice it says back in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, it says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, for a time, a very short period of time. There should only be a cessation of sexual relations for a short period of time. He then says, come together again. You see, that is the command, that there be a regular sexual relationship between you and your spouse. For what reason? He says, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So when there is defrauding of sexual relations in a marriage, you are, you are opening the door for Satan to tempt your mate. Exactly what is described here and taught here in Proverbs chapter 5. And so these issues are essential. The only exception to not have sex with your spouse when you are asked is by consent. The Greek word for consent is agreement. 
if you agree with one another. Now, if your spouse says, honey, I've got a headache, the proverbial headache. I don't feel good. I am getting the flu. I am not real romantic tonight. If that is the, the statement, why wouldn't you consent to that? Choosing out of love to consent to that. Now, if every single night for the next month somebody says they've got a headache, then obviously you'd say, you know, that's probably a lame excuse. That's probably not a reasonable excuse or a valid excuse. And so you'd have to say, no, I don't consent to that. And we need to talk about this because something's wrong here. And hopefully that will bring you to the place of resolving the other issues that may be askew in your relationship. So come together again and express your affection. Now, number six, intimacy is developed as you understand your mate's needs, desires, likes, and dislikes. I think that this is essential. Understanding comes from one thing, and that is by investigation. That's where it begins. In 1 Peter 3, 7, Paul, or Peter declares, he said, uh, dwell with your wives according to understanding. The Hebrew, or excuse me, the Greek word there for understanding is by, to know by investigation. You have to know them, but that means you have to investigate them. You have to come to an understanding by simply asking them, do you like this or do you not like this? And then you have to remember, somebody said, no, that is not pleasurable to me. That is not exciting to me. In fact, that just drives me crazy. It bugs me. Don't do that. And you are, have the responsibility to remember that. So understanding comes by asking or investigating, and it comes by communicating. Many times couples don't want to talk about this issue, but, and they just they endure things that they shouldn't have to because they just simply haven't communicated. The scripture again tells you in Proverbs 1, verse 2, the reason for, and the purpose for Proverbs was to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Understanding comes from words. Words that you give an understanding of what you like or dislike. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. There Solomon says, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. You need to know and understand what your spouse likes and what they do not like. When they say, honey, this is just so unromantic when you do this or say this or act in this manner, you have got to remember that and don't do that. If you want a romantic, intimate relationship with each other, then you have to remember those things and take that particular action. It is essential. Forcing your desires over and over again is just plain selfish. That's all it is. I want this. And I don't care what is pleasurable to you or romantic to you. I'm going to do what I please. That is incredibly unloving. And it destroys the intimacy in your relationship. If you want to lovingly meet your mate's needs, then I guarantee you, you will provoke a loving response. Number seven and last, intimacy is developed as you deal with your thought life. Now this is essential. Tim LaHaye, in his book, The Act of Marriage, he said your mind is the most important part of sex. Your mind. You say, how can your mind be the most important part of sex? Well, let me explain. What does he mean by that statement? Well, your mind can be your greatest hindrance or your greatest asset in your relationship with each other. Your mind, the way you think. Let me give you four particular 
ways that I have found this is critical as I've counseled couples on this subject. For the first, to the person who is refusing to change, the person that when I begin to speak about sex, they say, well, in their mind they're saying, oh, I don't care what the Bible says, I don't like sex, I never have and I never will and I'm not going to change. Now when a person thinks in that way, nothing is going to change because it starts right up here. You have to be at least willing to say, I, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to do something to make our intimacy grow and our relationship develop. This area, I think, is essential. You have to think correctly. You have to think biblically. Now, secondly, the person who is tormented by past sexual abuse. This is, again, by far probably the most people that I talk to that struggle with, well, every time their spouse touches them or begins to approach them, the, in their mind comes some very painful images in their, in their head. And it's incredibly detracting from any kind of romantic, exciting experience with their spouse because those images that they have and they recall to their mind they think they can't do anything about them but you can you don't have to think that way you don't have to go back to those past images and those past experiences a person chooses to allow themselves to go back to them and so it is essential that you say you know what, I am closing the door on this. I am not going back in my head to these experiences, these situations, because that is not what's happening today. And if you, but if you allow your mind to go back there, do you know what happens? I'll tell you, you start taking out your anger, your resentment upon the person you're married to. I have people say that to me all the time, inmates. In, mar in marriage counseling. They, they tell me, hey, you know what? You're punishing me for what somebody else did to you. And that's not fair. And that's exactly correct. It's not fair. You cannot punish your husband or wife for what was done to you by someone else. That's just, it doesn't cut it. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not biblical. It means that you have to address that issue in your thought life and you have to resolve it in your heart and you have to go forward. You have to forgive and let it go. A third area where your thought life is critical is for the person who has a homosexual or a lesbian past. Counsel this one many times as well. This is where a person's sexual identity is completely cockeyed. It is off the charts. It's skewed. And I'll tell you, it begins right here in your thinking. Now, what I tell people to do in this regard is they first need to study the scriptures as to what does the Bible teach about sex. What does it say? That is what you should be thinking about this subject. This is what God says. God is the guy who created sex in the first place. So, I guess I should try and figure out what does he think about this? Did he create it to be harmful, hurtful, painful for me to destroy my life and make my life a living hell? No, he didn't. He created it to be a good, enjoyable, pleasurable, loving, affectionate part of a person's marriage. That's what he created it for. So, if that's what he created it for, and that's what the scripture says, if I think anything other than that, I am not thinking biblically. I am not thinking the way God would have me to think. I am not thinking according to the will of God. So, I have to reject those thoughts that are contrary to scripture, I have to make a conscious choice to reject them. And I then have to 
use my mind to stir up my passion, my desire for my spouse. And that brings me to the fourth person, the person who has no sexual drive. Now, some of this is biological. Some of it is hormonal. Um, the amount of a man's or a woman's sexual drive is directly dependent upon how much testosterone is flowing through your bloodstream. Whether it's male or female, that's the issue. And all kinds of things adjust that hormone in your body. And I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what, how that takes place, but I'll tell you, the people that I have counseled with over the years, a woman comes in after she's had a baby and she's upset and her husband's upset. Why don't I have any sexual drive anymore? What's wrong with me? I go, I don't know. You need to go back to your doctor. Uh, a woman comes in in menopause and says, I have absolutely no sexual drive any longer. Sex is painful to me. I send them back to their doctor again. But that tells you that there is a biological issue here. And you need to deal with the biological issues. But if it's just your mind, you can take care of it with your mind. How do you do that? Well, I think that it's very easy to use your mind in a godly way to stir up your own sexual desire for your husband or wife. It's a very simple thing. The scripture says in Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9, it says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, or in other words, think on these things. And he said, the God of peace will be with you. Now, when a person has a struggle with homosexual or lesbian background, and they're thinking the only way that they can get sexually excited is they have to think about uh, a man or a woman to get sexually aroused, I say, that's sin. You have to think about your wife or your husband. First, you have to control your thinking. Then secondly, for someone who has absolutely no sexual drive, you just need to think about the, the one time that you enjoyed sex with one another and, and it was a pleasurable, enjoyable time. Why don't you just, when you know your husband or wife is going to desire sex that particular night, think about that time that you had with one another. And you know what's going to happen? You will be surprised at how you will stir up your own desires for your own spouse. It's not sin. In fact, it is pure. It is a pure thought to think about your spouse in this manner. It is good, is it not? The Bible says it's good. It says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So if the bed is undefiled, you know that's the same Greek word for holy. It says the bed is, it's, it's a holy thing. So for me to think about my spouse in a sexual way is a holy thing. It's a good thing. And I'll tell you, that will stir up your desire. I have told people to do this, and you know, they come back to me and they say, Steve, it works. It works. It's simple. In Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10, Solomon said, or excuse me, Solomon's wife said, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Isn't that interesting? She knew that his desire was toward her and not toward someone else. Very clear indication. And so your desire should be toward one another. And you have something you can do to stir up your desire for one another. If you are in one of those four areas, I would encourage you, 
ask the Lord to control your thinking. Ask him to bring your thinking in line with what the scripture teaches on this area. And I'll tell you, it'll change you. It'll radically change you. And it will bring an, a level and a depth of intimacy that you will, you will enjoy, you will love, and you will grow in that intimacy because that's really what he desires. He wants you to be satisfied at all times. He wants you to be enraptured, intoxicated romantically with your spouse. And so if that is not the case, you say, Lord, get me there. Because this is an essential spark that will make our marriage go. And we need it. And so help us to do a little sparking. Amen? I want to thank you for watching our program. I trust that God has spoken to your heart and ministered to you many truths concerning how to resolve the problems in your marriage. I believe that God is reaching out to you and He's trying to show you the way to solve these issues. For those of you that have never made a commitment to Christ, your first step is to come to Christ. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you want that rest? Do you want His peace? Do you want His power in your life? Then ask Him to come in and take over your life right now. Ask Him to forgive you and to fill you with His Holy Spirit, and He will radically change your life and your marriage. For those of you that have already made a commitment to Christ, you're a Christian, I would encourage you, stop and consider where are you failing in your marriage? and then obey God's commands, those commands that you've heard in this study, and then trust Him to do it. Trust His promise that He will come and help you if you'll ask. Jesus said, again, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. May the Lord richly bless your marriage. You are the is my fall You are the friend that answers my call You are my day You are my night You are my love You are my my sin